Greetings, Pokéfans! Michael here, and a big thing in the Pokémon YouTube world right now are playthrough challenge videos. Can you beat a certain Pokémon game with a certain challenging condition? One of the most popular formats is, can you beat this game with only this particular, usually weak, Pokémon? But there are other challenge variances as well. I thought it would be fun to do one of these playthrough challenges myself, and the one that I came up with was, is it possible to beat a Pokemon game without catching any Pokemon? For the purposes of this, I define catching a Pokemon as obtaining a Pokemon by throwing a Pokeball at it. Therefore, the only ways to obtain Pokemon are via gift Pokemon and hatching any eggs. So, the available Pokemon are very limited. Here are the rules for my no-catch playthrough. The first is that I cannot throw a Pokeball at any Pokemon, therefore I can't catch any Pokemon. And number two is that trading with another game is only allowed for the purposes of evolving a Pokemon if necessary. And if you do this, it has to be an immediate trade and trade back. In-game trades are allowed, but spoiler alert, all of the in-game trades in the game that I'm going to be playing require Pokemon that you have to catch in the wild, so I won't be doing any. So in short, no catching and no trading Pokemon from other games. All other methods of obtaining Pokemon are fair game. I selected Pokemon Platinum to be the game that I do this challenge in for two reasons. The first is that I haven't played through Sinnoh in several years, so I wanted to again. And the second is that the available Pokemon in this style of playthrough will make my final team pretty interesting. Also, you probably noticed that I am filming with a new camera. Want to give a quick shout out to my sponsor, Elgato, for sending me a new cam link that I'll be using to record and stream from here on out. So if you want to pick up some of their cool content creation tech, check out the link in the description. So don't forget to leave a like on the video and let's dive in to see if I can beat Pokemon Platinum without catching any Pokemon. The game starts out like any other Pokemon playthrough, and it's not long before I get to choose my starter, the first gift Pokemon in the game. When I originally thought up this playthrough, I at first thought that I would have to choose Piplup because Empoleon can learn every HM in the game except Fly. Since Surf and Waterfall are necessary to beat the game, and the other two starters cannot learn those, I thought I had to pick Empoleon. However, during my research, I discovered that Eevee is a gift Pokemon in Platinum, which you can evolve into Vaporeon long before you need Surf to progress in the game. The only HMs you need prior to getting the Eevee are Cut and Rock Smash, and all three starters can learn both of those moves. Therefore, I can actually choose any starter that I want, with the only caveat being that if I choose Turtwig or Chimchar, I have to evolve my Eevee into Vaporeon, because no other obtainable Pokémon can learn Waterfall. I decided to go with Chimchar because it would be my only Pokémon for a good chunk of the early game, and it handles the first two gyms very well. Plus, it gets stabbed from Rock Smash, a move that it'll be stuck with for a while. I defeat Barry pretty easily before making my way to Sand Gym Town, where Professor Rowan lets me name the Chimchar. I named him Ludacrist. I know that name sounds weird, but it's actually a callback to the first playthrough I ever did here on my YouTube channel, my first Nuzlocke Pokemon Platinum. I started with Chimchar in that game too, and named him Ludacris. He survived all the way until tragically falling to my rival's final Pokémon in the last battle right before the Pokémon League. So therefore, this Chimchar is Ludacrist because it's Ludacris who has risen from the dead. After backtracking to say goodbye to my mom, Don has us go through the catching tutorial, something completely unnecessary for this playthrough. She gives me some Pokéballs and I immediately sold all of them. No use for them, so might as well make money. Ludacris swept through all of the Pokémon I met pretty easily before evolving into Munferno right before the Orberg Gate. The hiker inside gave me the HM for Rock Smash, but I decided to wait to teach it to Munferno until it's necessary. I arrive in Orberg, and in the process of grabbing items outside the mine, I accidentally found a hidden heart scale. This will come in handy later. I find Rourke and tell him to get his dumb butt back to his more important job, then head to the gym. I make quick work of the trainers, then take on Rourke. Since Ludacrist is the only Pokémon getting any experience, he is very overleveled for this fight. Mach Punch makes quick work of his Geodude, Onix, and Cranidos, and I have my first badge. Now that it's useful, I go ahead and teach Monferno Rock Smash. On my way back through the Orberg Gate, I head to the basement and pick up the TM for Flash, which I'll use later. 
Back in Jubilife, Don and I take out the Galactic Grunts with little issue. I then fight my way to Floroma Town, take out some more Galactic Grunts on the way to fighting Mars. Her Zubat is dealt with easily, and while a crit scratch from Perugly did a decent chunk, a Rock Smash followed by a Mock Punch were enough to take it out. I head out and battle my way up to a turn of Forest, where Cheryl tags along for a little bit. This trip was uneventful since Flame Wheel decimated everything in the forest. I arrive in Eterna City, the site of finally gaining some new team members. My first step was to speak to the underground man to get the Explorer Kit, because we're digging for fossils! <laughs> since the process of reviving a fossil does not require me to throw a Pokeball, fossil Pokemon are fair game for this playthrough. However, in Platinum, it's more interesting than in other games because I didn't get a choice as to which fossil Pokemon I got to use. If you didn't know, in Diamond, you will only find Skull Fossils, which become Cranidos. And in Pearl, you can only find Armor Fossils, which become Shieldon. In Platinum, you can still only find one type of fossil in the Underground before beating the League. However, which one you can find is determined randomly when you start the game. If your trainer ID number ends in an odd number, you'll find skull fossils, and if it ends in an even number, you'll find armor fossils. While I could have known which fossil Pokemon I would get on my team at the start of the playthrough, I decided not to look at my number. I thought it would be more fun to discover which fossil I would find by simply digging it up. You know, it makes me feel more like a real paleontologist. I head underground, and after about 10 minutes of digging, I find my fossil, and it's a skull fossil. Cranidos will be my new team member, but not quite yet. While I could backtrack all the way to Orberg City to revive the fossil immediately, that's a pretty long trip. If I wait to do the revival until I get my bicycle, it's a, just a straight shot down the cycling road to get back to Orberg. Since a rock-type Pokemon isn't going to help me very much with the grass-type gym, I decided I would just wait. I head back up and straight into Gardenia's gym. Ludacris' flame wheel sears through all of the gym trainers, and it does the same to Gardenia's team, Okoing all three of them. That wasn't really surprising, though. After all, Monferno was five levels higher than her ace, Roserade. After some conversations, Cynthia gives me the HM for Cut. I debated then making the long trek back to Orberg to teach Cranidos Cut instead of Monferno, but then I realized that Cranidos cannot learn Cut, only Rampardos can, so I begrudgingly taught Monferno Cut. I bust into the Galactic Eterna building and fight my way to the top. Once there, I pick up the upgrade, then fight Jupiter. Her Zubat was a joke, but Skunk Tank was a bit tougher. Its bulk meant I had to hit it with multiple flame wheels, but I wore it down without too much issue. Resisting its Night Slashes definitely helped. After clearing out the building, I was careful to save the game a lot. The reason for this is that Cynthia is about to give me a Togepi Egg, which will be my next member of the team. The scary thing, though, is that Togepi can either hatch with the ability Serene Grace, which is amazing, or Hustle, which is awful. Hustle boosts the Pokémon's physical attack while lowering its accuracy, but since Togekiss is a special attacker, all this ability would do to it is lower its accuracy. I was not about to deal with an inaccurate Togekiss the entire playthrough, so I saved before receiving the egg, because if you didn't know, the attributes of a Pokémon are determined when the egg is generated, not when it hatches. Thankfully, the first one hatched with Serene Grace, so all was well. I named it Gabriel after the angel from the Bible, since Togekiss is very angelic. I already had a Christ Pokémon, so I figured another biblical name would fit well. As soon as Gabriel hatched, I swung by the cycle shop to grab a bike, which would have helped with hatching a bit. I actually don't know why I didn't do this beforehand. I biked down to Orberg, revived my Skull Fossil, and named my new Cranidos Solomon. I decided to stick with the biblical names theme, and Solomon fits Cranidos well. Solomon was wise, and Cranidos has a big head. So it's got a big brain, maybe. I taught Solomon Rock Tomb immediately because, very stupidly, this Rock-type Pokémon does not learn a Rock-type move until Head Smash at level 52. I was not about to deal with not having a Stab move this entire playthrough, so burn the TM. My next order of business was getting Togepi evolved as soon as possible because it is completely useless as a Togepi. Thankfully, I was given the Soothe Bell upon entering Eterna City, so after a little while of switch training, leveling up, and journeying all the way through Wayward Cave, Gabriel evolved into a Togetic. By the way, I had taught Flash to Togepi to get through Wayward Cave, because it's the only one that can learn it. After Gabriel evolved, I taught it Grass Knot. 
I needed some way to counter water types in the meantime because my other two Pokemon are weak to water. And also, Togetic doesn't learn an actual attack until level 33, and I was not about to only have Metronome that entire time. I battled my way to Heart Home City where I obtained the gift Eevee. I considered saving before receiving the Eevee so that I could reset for a female, so if I wanted to, I could breed Monferno and Eevee to get a lot more Eevees and all the other Eeveelutions, but I decided that having a team of just Eeveelutions would be kind of boring, so I just took the first one that I got. It ended up being a male Eevee, and I named it Levi. The Leviathan is a sea monster from the Bible, staying on theme, but I thought it would be funny if, like, the Leviathan is actually just a small sea cat, so I named my future Vaporeon just Little Levi. I decided to go ahead and challenge Fantina without grinding. After all, Solomon has sky-high attack and pursuit, so I figured I'd be fine. Learning Assurance during the course of battling the gym trainers was extra great, since Assurance doubles its power if Cranidos takes a hit first, which was likely since it's a bit slow. I took out her Duskull without much issue. I was hit with a Future Sight after it fainted, but that was fine. Then she sent out Miss Magius, and things got... bad. Miss Magius immediately goes for a super effective Magical Leaf, a move that I did not remember that it had. I thought Solomon might survive it, but nope, it crit, and my only Pokemon with super effective damage goes down. I bring in Ludacrist, who is five levels higher than Miss Magius. However, that wasn't enough. Miss Magius outsped us and confused Monferno, who then hurt itself immediately. Then Psybeam did most of my health, and while I hit the second Flame Wheel, it wasn't enough to KO. I was a bit salty, because if Monferno had not hurt itself in its confusion, I would have taken out Miss Magius right away. I switched in Togetic to tank some hits while I healed up Monferno. However, since I only had Super Potions at this point, it took two turns to fully heal Monferno up. Miss Magius finished off Togetic, but I brought in Monferno back in to finish it off with a Flame Wheel. And it lives! The Miss Magius lives! It did this much the first time, then doesn't KO it from half health? What the heck, dude? At this point, I was screwed. While well, I could have brought an Eevee to sack it off while I healed Monferno, thanks to her Super Potion, Ms. Magius definitely needed two Flame Wheels now. I used one more Flame Wheel hoping for a crit, but didn't get it, so I gave up and let Ms. Magius finish both Monferno and Eevee off. My first loss of the playthrough was done. Licking my wounds, I grinded Cranidos up to level 27 and got Monferno a level in the process. In the second attempt, I tried to Oko Duskull with Assurance, but barely could not. Duskull used Future Sight, and this time I wanted Cranidos to stay totally healthy to make sure I could tank a Magical Leaf. I brought in Togetic and messed around with Metronome and Yawn for a little bit before eventually getting impatient and bringing in Monferno to finish off Duskull. In came Haunter, which I was confident I could Oko with Assurance. I could, but not before taking some damage from Sucker Punch. That was fine though, because Cranidos still has 62 HP, more than what it had in the last battle. Miss Magius comes in, goes for Magical Leaf, and critical hits again for the second time in a row. I hate this Pokemon now. Cranidos goes down, but I quickly formulate a plan. Since I don't have to use Togetic's turns to heal Monferno, I can put Miss Magius to sleep to allow Monferno to KO it safely. I get off the yawn, then randomly click Metronome on the turn I expected Togetic to go down. However, Togetic survives, then the Metronome happens, and it becomes Transform. What? I now have a powerful Miss Magius with Shadow Ball up against a sleeping Miss Magius. This is amazing. I go for Shadow Ball and it does more than half. The enemy Miss Magius heals with its Citrus Berry, but it doesn't matter because I got the special defense drop. The second Shadow Ball finishes it off, and I beat Fantina using her own Miss Magius against her. This was probably the wildest gym battle that I have ever had. It was awesome. I start making my way to Salacion Town, but not before my rival attacks. This battle was pretty uneventful though, and I beat him easily. My top priority is now getting to the Salacion Ruins, because that's where the Waterstone to evolve Eevee is. I skip as many trainers as possible on the way, enter the ruins, and find the Waterstone. I evolved Levi immediately, and now I have my Vaporeon. Unfortunately, what I didn't realize is that I already missed a water type move on Vaporeon. It learns Water Gun by level up at level 15, but I got the Eevee at level 20. 
Vaporeon doesn't learn another level up stab move until Hydro Pump at the wildly inappropriate level of 71. 71, are you kidding? This means that unfortunately I can't teach Vaporeon a water type move until I get the Brine TM from Wake. So for the time being, Levi is still useless. I grab Defog from the ruins and teach it to Gabriel. After a quick, depressing detour to the Lost Tower, I begin my trek to Veilstone. This was arduous. It's a long trip with no healing, and the last battle is one of those cursed Ace Trainer double battles. I beat their last Pokemon with only a poisoned Hurt Monferno left standing. I genuinely hate that battle. It gives me a hard time no matter the playthrough. But I still make it to Veilstone without losing, so I'm finally able to grab my fifth team member, Porygon. I named it Galaxian, like the book of the Bible Galatians, but more science-y sounding. If you recall, I already got the upgrade from the Galactic Eterna building, so I was able to evolve it into Porygon 2 immediately. My next step was to take on Maylene's fighting type gym, but I didn't want to do that yet. My only attack that was super effective on fighting type Pokemon was Galaxian's Psybeam, which isn't super effective on Metatite or Lucario, and is also on a normal type Pokemon. But I had a plan! Since this is Platinum and not Diamond and Pearl, just west of Pastoria is a Shard Move Tutor, where I can teach Togetic Air Cutter, a special stab flying type move. I make the trek south all the way there, only to discover that I don't have enough shards. Ugh. After digging in the underground for half an hour and only finding one red shard, backtracking to Wayward Cave and several other places, and evolving Solomon into a Rampardos, I finally had the shards I needed. I taught Togetic Air Cutter, and now I was ready for the Veilstone Gym. Side note, while I was digging for shards, I found a couple more skull fossils, so if I want more Rampardos, I can get them. I'm just not going to do that, that would be dumb. First, she sends out Metatite, but sadly, Air Cutter is just shy of Oko-ing it. It hits Togetic with a Rock Tomb, which lowers its speed, something that I neglected to pay attention to. I go for Grass Knot to finish it off to save some Air Cutter PP, but that ended up being foolish. Metatite now outspeeds and hits us with Drain Punch, doing some damage and healing itself in the process. Now Grass Knot doesn't KO, and I'm forced to take another hit before finishing it off. Machoke comes in, and I switch to Porygon 2, hoping to either live a hit or outspeed. I live a Karate Chop, and again, barely don't KO it with Psybeam. Why is this barely not KOing thing happening so much to me? I decide to risk it and try to live a second Karate Chop, which I do, so Porygon 2 finishes Machoke off. She brings in her Lucario, which Monferno easily handles, actually scoring a burn with Flame Wheel in the process. Maylene was done. I head to the Galactic Warehouse and get Fly, which I promptly teach to Togetic. I fly back to Pastoria for Wake's Gym, a battle which I am actually really concerned for. My only Pokemon that resists water and is actually immune to it is Vaporeon, but Vaporeon can't really do any damage back. My only super effective attack is Grass Knot, which is not Stab, and is also on a Pokemon that is weak to the Ice and Rock type moves several of his Pokemon have. I bought the TM for Thunder from the Veilstone Department Store and taught it to Galaxian to help out. I did some grinding which evolved Ludacrist into Infernape, but I was still worried. I beat my rival before the gym, beat all the gym trainers, then started my battle with Wake. I lead with Gabriel, expecting him to lead with Quagsire, but he leads with Gyarados instead. I'm forced to switch to Rampardos, who I thought had a chance to survive and hit back with a Rock Tomb, but nope, it was O-Code by a Waterfall. However, at least now I can bring in Porygon 2 safely. I click Thunder, but Gyarados' Waterfall flinches me. He doesn't flinch me with the second Waterfall, but Thunder misses. Have I ever talked about how I genuinely hate the move Thunder? Like... It misses at just the worst times. After healing up, Thunder finally lands, but Porygon 2 is weakened badly. Wake brings in Floatzel, and I bring in a healthy Togetic to use Grass Knot, but then Wake hits with an Ice Fang, which Togetic lives, but gets frozen as a result. You have gotta be freezing kidding me. I decide to sack off Togetic to heal up Porygon 2, but that was a mistake. While Porygon 2 landed its first Thunder and O-Code Floatzel, I realized that I should have preserved Togetic because I needed Grass Knot to beat Quagsire. During the process of using Psybeam to whittle down Quagsire, it uses Yawn. 
I switch into Infernape, expecting it to tank a Mud Shot, but Quagsire used Water Pulse instead. While Infernape did survive the hit, it got confused in the process, then hurt itself in confusion on the turn that would have ended the battle. It goes down to Water Pulse, but Porygon 2 is then able to come in and finish things off. Remember how I said that my second battle with Fantina was one of the wildest gym battles I've ever had? Well, this battle with Wake is probably one of the most hacks-filled battles that I've ever had. Flinching, Thunder missing, Ice Fang freezing, Water Pulse confusing, then hurting myself. Ugh, it was awful. I am glad it's over. Wake gives us the TM for Brian, so finally Levi isn't useless. I taught it to him immediately. I then chase the Galactic Grunt to Lake Valor, get the secret potion from Cynthia, and start the trek to Celestic Town. This trip is mostly fine, except for another awful Ace Trainer double battle. God, my team just really does not do well against Gyarados. I fight Cyrus in the Celestic Ruins, and the battle was a cakewalk. I almost swept him with Solomon alone, but a missed Rock Tomb forced me to switch to Porygon 2 to beat his Murkrow. But I ended up crushing him, then Cynthia's grandma gives me Surf. I immediately taught it to Levi, and then I headed to various places to get all sorts of goodies, most notably the Flamethrower TM from Fuego Ironworks, which I taught to Ludacrist. After battling the trainers on Route 219, 220, and 221, I headed to Canalave. This town is a big deal because it houses the home of the Move Deleter. I can finally delete any unwanted and unneeded HM moves from my team, so I promptly deleted Cut on Infernape and Defog on Togetic. I beat my rival on the bridge, then rushed over to Iron Island for two very important things. Well, actually three since Riley gives me strength, but two team-related things. The first is the Riolu Egg, my final team member for this playthrough, then immediately after Riley gives me that, I snag the Shiny Stone, finally being able to evolve Gabriel into a Togekiss. I quickly fly to Pastoria and use the Heart Scale that I accidentally found back in Orberg to teach Togekiss Air Slash its best move. Let the Serene Grace flinching commence. I then head back to Salation and bike back and forth for a while until I hatch the Riolu, which I named Luke, a book of the Bible and also short for Lucario. I finally have my final squad of six, but then at this point I notice that every member of my team except the genderless Galaxian is male. I expected that from my starter and my Eevee since I knew they both had 87.5% male gender ratios, but I was surprised that all of the other three ended up being male. Like, even Togepi. I thought Togepi was mostly female. Nope. Turns out, it is 87.5% male. As is Riolu. As is Cranidos. Every member of my team that can have a gender is 87.5% male. It's wild. The only reason I can think of is that they want to make it harder to breed gift Pokemon? I don't know. After some switch training with the Soothe Bell, Luke became a Lucario. He was still several levels below the rest of the team, but I felt safe tossing on the experience share and heading to the Canalave Gym. The gym trainers were swept through easily, as was Byron's team. Ludacrist o code all three of his Pokemon without taking a hit. I do all the stuff at the library, hear the Lake Valor explosion, then head there to fight Saturn. I make quick work of him, then head to Lake Verity where I beat Mars in a similarly easy fashion. It was now time for me to make the frigid trek to Snowpoint. I taught Lucario strength to spread the HM burden around a little bit, and then I headed to Mount Coronet. I was afraid of the fog for a bit because recall that I deleted Defog, but thankfully there are no trainers in this room. A Max Repel let me run through it without a hitch. The rest of the trip was arduous, but doable. I was cautious and backtracked to the Rest Lodge multiple times, but before long, I made it to Snowpoint. I immediately headed to the gym and beat virtually every gym trainer with Lucario in an attempt to help catch it up to the rest of the team. Then it was time for Candice, and most of the battle went smoothly. Lucario O-Code Sneasel, Vaporeon O-Code Piloswine, and Infernape O-Code Abomasnow. Things only got sticky when Frostlass came in, as it got up two double teams that made me miss two flamethrowers in a row. It struck with a powerful psychic that almost KO'd Ludacris, but thankfully he survived and landed a flamethrower, Okoing the Frostlass. Now that Candace was done, I could use Rock Climb outside of battle. I just didn't have it. I had to go back to the frozen wasteland and pick it up behind this guy's house. I never remember it's there on the first trip. I taught it to Infernape because it still had an open move slot from deleting Cut, and I didn't really care about the next move, which was Fire Spit. I climb up to Lake Acuity, see Jupiter Taunt Barry, then fly to Veilstone. I begin progressing through the Galactic Headquarters, finding the dubious disc in the process. This finally allows me to evolve Galaxian into Porygon Z, 
finally getting my entire team to its fully evolved state. I reach Cyrus and take him on in battle. Despite taking some hits, Rampardos KOs both his Sneasel and Crobat. I heal up against his Honchkrow and hit a Rock Tomb, which barely doesn't Oko. Why does this keep happening to me? My next Rock Tomb misses because of course it does, and then Solomon goes down. But no worries, I bring in Galaxian to finish off the Honchkrow. Cyrus gives me the Master Ball as a reward for winning, and I meant to sell this or toss it, but I forgot. My next fight is Saturn, and I didn't revive Rampardos before this fight because I didn't think it would be necessary. Porygon Z handles Golbat no problem, but then was rudely KO'd by Toxicroak. Togekiss then beats Toxicroak easily, and then Infernape cleans up with a flamethrower on the Bronze Ore. I free the Lake Trio before beginning the climb up to Mount Coronet, a famously grueling journey. It turns out not to be too bad though, thanks to Max Repels, and I arrive at the summit. The multi-battle with Barry versus Mars and Jupiter was my next fight, and Barry sends out Munchlax. I was disappointed, but also wrong. Barry's Munchlax was weirdly really good in this fight. Imagine my shock when I see a Munchlax Oko a skunk tank six levels higher than it. To be fair, it had been screeched earlier, but by Munchlax, so it gets credit for those strats. The goal mats proved to be pretty annoying with dodging attacks and outspeeding us and again, barely surviving hits, but despite Porygon Z going down, I still finished off the battle without too much issue. Also, very important side note, there was a good chunk of the battle where it looked like Skunk Tank was constantly smelling Perugly's butt. Barry heals his squad, then Cyrus does his evil time and space mumbo jumbo. I follow him into the distortion world, then meet back up at the end. The infamous battle with Cyrus from my first Nuzlocke begins. Infernape Oko's the Houndoom with no issue. Porygon Z lives a waterfall from Gyarados without flinching and fires back with a discharge, which Gyarados barely survives. What is it with this playthrough? Cyrus heals Gyarados back up while my second discharge gets it down to red health, but Porygon Z's health is now too low to live a waterfall. I decide to sack off Porygon Z and bring in my fastest Pokemon Ludacrist in order to outspeed and finish it off. I knock out a Gyarados with a flamethrower, something that I don't actually think I've ever done before. Rampardos handled Crobat with ease, and while the battle against Honchkrow needed some healing, after barely surviving a Night Slash, Rampardos O-Code it. Weavile then tried to make Lucario flinch with a fake out, but Lucario's inner focus prevented that, the first time I've actually seen this happen. Lucario easily defeats Weavile with an Aura Sphere. My next battle is Giratina, which I must defeat because obviously I can't catch it. I tried with Rampardos for a short bit, but then Giratina went for a Shadow Force. I switched to Gabriel to absorb the hit, and then several Air Slashes later, Giratina goes down. I beat the Devil with an Angel. It was now time for the Sunny Shore Gym, which I was deeply concerned for, since the only ground move I had was Earthquake on Rampardos, no one on my team resisted electric, and they were all pretty underleveled. I decided to go in with the strategy of keeping Rampardos alive as long as possible and see if I could pull something out of my butt. If I don't, I'll try again after some grinding. He leads with Jolteon and I with Infernape. Jolteon paralyzes Infernape with Thunder Wave, but I'm able to land my close combat. Unfortunately, it's not enough to KO. On the next turn, when he heals, I get fully paralyzed. The following turn I try for Flamethrower as to not make myself too frail, but it's far less damage than what I need. Charge Beam does a good chunk too, so I have to heal with my only full restore. Jolteon's next Charge Beam almost Oko's Infernape, but that's fine because now I can simply outspeed in close combat on the next turn. Unfortunately, Jolteon had Quick Attack and Infernape goes down. I bring in Lucario and barely live a Charge Beam, allowing me to KO it with close combat. He brings in Raichu, and I decide to stay in to get off one more close combat before fainting. However, Raichu is faster than I realized and outspeeds Lucario, KOing it. Yeah, I probably should've done a bit more research cause a lot of his team is surprisingly speedy. I bring in Porygon Z, hoping for Focus Blast to be Focus Blast and miss a lot. The first one doesn't miss, but I thankfully survive and hit back with a Signal Beam. The next Focus Blast misses, so more damage. The next one misses again, and I think I've beaten Raichu, but no, barely survives. This game genuinely hates me. Okay, that's an exaggeration. I did, after all, just dodge two Focus Blasts in a row, but come on, I was salty. It was now my three Pokemon against his three Pokemon, but two of my standing three are weak to electric. Things were not looking good. I bring in my fastest conscious Pokemon to finish off Raichu, that being Togekiss. 
Unfortunately, it's still not fast enough, and I take some charge beam damage before finishing it off. His next Pokemon is Luxray, and I decide the best course of action is to pray to the Flinch Gods. They give me one, but that's it. Gabriel goes down to a Thunderfang after I land two Air Slashes. I decided it was time to bring in my ace, Solomon, because Levi had no hope of doing anything here. Luxray hits with a Thunderfang and it does a disappointingly large amount of damage, but my Earthquake KOs it. Electivire is the last one left, so I bring in Vaporeon to take a hit while I heal Rampardos. A Thunder Punch and a Quick Attack later, and Vaporeon is done. It's now Rampardos versus Electivire, winner take all. Thunder Punch does about half, but doesn't paralyze, and thank Helix, Earthquake, Okos. The battle is over, and I get my final gym badge despite being underleveled, so pat myself on the back for that. <laughs> okay, yes, I used six Pokemon compared to his four and also did a lot of healing, but hey, come on, I already can't catch any Pokemon, don't want to make this too hard. Jasmine gives me the HM for Waterfall, which I teach to Levi. I then head off to the Victory Road and get through it with little incident. I had some Pokemon faint along the way, but reviving them wasn't an issue. I make it through and arrive at the Pokemon League. I have one final battle with Barry before entering the League. And may I just say how much BS it is that his flying type has a super powerful fighting type move that is super effective against my two Pokemon who have super effective damage against it? It was ridiculous. I ended up having to beat the freaking Staraptor with Togekiss. The rest of the battle wasn't bad though. He did some cheeky switches, but I handled them just fine. Barry was done, but I wasn't ready for the league just yet. My team was levels 48 to 51, which is definitely not high enough for the league since Cynthia's Garchomp is 62. It was time to grind. I got the entire squad up to level 55, then gave them a rare candy each. Once the grinding was done, I flew to the move deleter to get rid of every HM except Surf and Fly, because those moves are pretty good, and replace them with much better move sets. This was the final move set for each member of the entire team before I headed into the league. Eren was first up, and this battle was a joke. Rampardos, Togekiss, and Infernape handled every Pokemon easily. Next was Bertha, another easy battle. Togekiss's Grass Knot plus Vaporeon, Surf, and Ice Beam O-Code her entire team. Next up was Flint. This battle was a bit tougher than the first two due to the prevalence of electric and grass moves on his team. While Houndoom was easily dispatched, my attempts at using rain as a strategy didn't go as smoothly as I'd hoped. Their electric attacks still hit hard, and at one point Sun got set up, but after some weather wars, a bit of healing, and an evolution face-off, I won with Vaporeon being the only one to faint. The next battle was Lucian, and oh my god, this was probably the most intense battle of the entire playthrough. Mr. Mime was easily KO'd with Payback, but not before setting up Reflect. Lucian brings in Bronzong, which I attempted to KO using a Mold Breaker Earthquake to bypass Levitate. However, Reflect prevents it from Okoing, and of course, the second one leaves it with just a sliver of health. He heals back up, and my next Earthquake does way less damage, meaning I needed to reconsider how to handle this. I bring in Vaporeon to tank his Calm Mind boosted attacks, which works well enough, and then I finish it off. Next was Alakazam, which was... really strong. I bring in Solomon for a payback that I knew would Oko, but Alakazam outspeeds and Okos with Focus Blast. I bring in Porygon Z hoping for a Focus Blast miss, but nope, another Pokemon down. I now have no idea what to do because Alakazam outspeeds my entire team. The only Pokemon I have left that could survive a hit from it is Togekiss, so I bring in Gabriel. And then I realize, Gabriel knows a physical move. Fly, a move that I never used in battle because Togekiss is a special attacker, proved to be my saving grace. With Alakazam's poor physical defense, I'm able to take it out with two flies, but not before taking a ton of damage in the process. Out comes Gallade, which I am confident I'll body with Air Slash, so I don't heal up Togekiss. Unfortunately, I was wrong, and it only does half. Gallade's Berry heals it, then it KOs Togekiss. I bring in Infernape to use Shadow Claw, hoping for a crit, but I don't get it. However, Infernape miraculously survives a Psycho Cut, and since I outspeed, a Gallade heal and two Shadow Claws later, Gallade is down. His final Pokemon is Espeon, and I hit it with a Shadow Claw before letting Infernape fall. I bring in Lucario, expecting to outspeed and finish it off with close combat. However, I do not outspeed, but thankfully Lucario lives with only 24 health. 
Espeon goes down to the close combat, and I win the battle. God, that was intense. I had two Pokemon in red HP left standing when I won that. It was close. I heal up though, and now it's time for the final battle with Cynthia. Gabriel beats Spiritomb with a few air slashes, no problem. Solomon spectacularly survives an Aura Sphere from Togekiss, but Rock Slide is barely not enough to KO. She heals and I Rock Slide again, doing less this time. I decide it's best to let Solomon faint so I can bring in someone else safely. I do just that and bring in Luke to clean up with extreme speed. Ludacrist easily dispatches her Lucario with close combat. Next was Milotic, a tricky Pokemon to deal with because of its bulk. While Galaxian's Thunderbolt does half, Milotic is faster and does more than half. I bring in Levi to absorb Milotic's water attacks and heal Galaxian. Switching Galaxian back in was risky though, so I go for a Brine that does too little to work. I switch in Luke to resist a Dragon Pulse, then finish my Lodic off with close combat. Next is the big bad, Garchomp. I taught Ice Beam to Vaporeon for this exact purpose. Garchomp outspeeds and goes for Dragon Rush, as expected, and Vaporeon survives. Ice Beam lands and thankfully, Oko's. If it didn't, I would have been in trouble. Her last Pokemon is Rose Raid, which Gabriel easily defeats with a pair of Air Slashes. The battle is over. Cynthia is defeated and I have beaten the main story of Pokemon Platinum without throwing a Pokeball at a single Pokemon, proving it is possible to beat at least one Pokemon game without catching any Pokemon. Thank you guys so much for watching this video and if you want to see some more playthrough challenge videos from me, let me know down in the comments below. Also, if you want to see some more of my fun Pokemon content in the meantime, I recommend this video here. Alright, that's all I have for now, so till next time, be fans! Gotta catch them all!